Welcome to Study with the Best, the magazine show that's all about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pina. On today's show, we'll look at archiving at CUNY. We'll go behind the scenes at the making of the LaGuardia and Wagner archive calendar, see what digital and analog preservation really means, and so much more. But first, I bet you didn't know that Brooklyn College has the only book and paper conservation lab in the CUNY system. Its conservator shares with us how important it is to preserve rare paper materials in the digital age. I got my degree in restoration and conservation from Moscow many, many years ago. And then I got my BA and MFA here at Brooklyn College. And uh, since uh, 2002, I'm here as a kind of conservator. This lab is special because, uh, first of all, it's the only conservation lab in CUNY. Only the Brooklyn College in the CUNY system has an opportunity to take care, professional care, for the materials. All the materials that I'm working on eventually will go on the shelves. This is the goal of our work here. Paper is dying paper is dying, to preserve, to stabilize, to save those extremely fragile materials is so important. In every case, it's amazing relationship between two living things, an assertor and, uh, and um, item on the table. The early books that we have, it's um, a 16th century wonderful medical atlases in Latin. We have a big Coney Island uh, collection. This poster, it was a, a bunch of pieces. After I connected all the pieces together, I used some special archival tape and special Japanese tissue. And it was a kind of puzzle for me. For the most uh, terrible cases, if you see the paper almost brown, it means the paper is dead. The only way to preserve them and uh, save them and stabilize them is to put them between two pieces of mylar. It's a wonderful archival materials that 100% protect the paper from pollution, from light and especially from the oil from our fingers. Passing my knowledge and my skills to students, it's another part of my job and it's the most rewarding and wonderful uh, part. I actually was flipping through the course book to look for something that jumped out on me, at me because um, you know, classics was great and I love that, but I wanted something that I could use practically in the real world and I knew I wanted to work in museums or something like that. And I saw the archives program and I thought that that was a really good fit for me because I like to be organized and I like to, to like be very hands-on with things. It's not, you know, just like sitting in a class and then uh, memorizing, it's just actual hand-on work on something great. We would um, rebind books and you know, create them from start to finish, you know, uh, gluing on the spines and creating covers with marble paper and cloth covers and creating even the boxes for rare books. And that was really rewarding because like at the end you see a great finished product that's very beautiful. Archival minor program for undergraduate students here, it's unique program. Nobody in a country have an archival minor archival uh, program on this level. It's definitely my favorite class. It's not just uh, the contents of a book, it's, it's uh, the things that make the book beautiful, like the cover, the art. You want to preserve that as well. History that you can hold. Now I digitize documents for archives um, so they can keep them, put them online, you know, share them with the world and you know you have to treat the documents with respect and make sure that you don't damage them further in the process of uh, digitization. So it's really great that I learned so much here like how to treat documents and respect history. 
digitizing actually it's a last stop. It's important, but it should be the last stop after conservator would do his or her job on the piece. When you're seeing on your table completely destroyed, heavily damaged piece of paper or a book, and you're putting your work, you're putting your effort, and you love to help the piece to survive. It's a great uh, a feeling. I would say it's not a job because when you're helping to someone, doesn't matter, piece of paper or person, it's became not a job, it's became just a way of life. What is a calendar more, much more than just a calendar? when it's produced by the historians at the LaGuardia and Wagner archives under the direction of Richard Lieberman. The first calendar I did was here at LaGuardia in 1978. It was about the history of Queens. I've always seen this calendar since, since I started working on it as an exhibit that we've put in your home. That what we've done is we've got a one-year exhibit and every month the exhibit changes. This year's calendar will be about housing. It's one of the um, major issues for our city and for our nation. What we wanted to do with this calendar was for CUNY to join that discussion of the problem of providing affordable housing, uh, not just in our city, but in our nation. So the theme is really the start of a discussion about housing in America. And it brings in everything else. It, brings in discussions of the economy, it brings in discussions of race, it brings in discussions of gender, of advertising. It is a, uh, a theme like a spider's web. You pull on it and you get the history of the country. So kitchens and uh, Native Americans and the company town and the squatters, you have ready, we'll look at it later, a little bit later. Okay, so they're like the first four months or whatever yeah. months. Yeah, then later. everything dated May 2, we have a lot of photos now. We could start really making final decisions. You have to be at the table looking at all these images and say to yourself and say to the others, what's going to grab somebody's eye? What are they going to like to live with? What's going to stimulate the conversation? I'm not Hallmark Cards. I'm not producing something that's just going to make you smile. I'm producing something that's going to make you think. When the team works together, what we're really looking for is an image that you'll want to live with for 30 days and also will kind of stimulate you to think about the topic because every month we'll have a different topic, you know, whether it be urban housing or rural housing or vacation housing. Calendars are visually driven and that's one of the problems uh, for a historian because we're not visually driven, we're text driven. It's difficult, even though I've been doing calendars for 30 years, for me to shift my priorities from text to image. But there's a voice in me that keeps saying, hello, calendars are going to be up there for 30 days. The image has to be really compelling. My training is to be controversial. And my training is to try and find the underside of the history of our city or the history of our country. So I'm always looking for that story that will make you pause and you think, whoa, I didn't think of it that way. Many times the images are dreadful. I mean, images of exploitation, images of uh, the most vulnerable people, images of poverty. These are not images you want on your wall for 30 days. This was the concept where it's like, it's like a pretty brochure for a housing development oh, that, like you a would, brochure. that you would yeah. like to live there. That's except cool. that like yeah, instead of flowers, it's weeds, and like these are homeless shelters. <laughs> I mean, they're the home homeless um, little shacks. You know, so it's kind of a, I don't understand the process. Irony. It's really, it's really it's art and not it's science. I really have never understood the process, although I marvel at it, because we start off in utter confusion. We start off with housing. Oh, yeah, yeah, what are we going to do? I try very hard to keep it very open. I see it somewhat like the making of cement. You have a while where it's all loose, and at some point it's going to harden. And that's usually when you're sending it off to the printer and you've got no more choices. My role in the group is to recognize all the ideas and try to sort of fill the room with the creative spark. And so when a new image will pop and a new idea will come up and a 
uh, you know, some new theme, and I want to water that. Twelve years ago, Senior Vice Chancellor Jay Hershenson contacted me and he said, do you want to bring your calendar to a national level? Do you want to bring it up a notch? And he brought me over to the New York Times, and we met with the people of the New York Times in education, and we did our first calendar, which was on voting. It's evolved into a relationship where they review the whole calendar, and they handle the publication of it. A lot of the relationship is, as you might imagine, sort of the branding of connecting CUNY, LaGuardia Community College, LaGuardia Wagner Archives, the New York Times. There's huge support from the President's office for the calendar. There's huge support from the Chancellor's office. And I am the one who quarterbacks it. The calendar has for a long time been this wonderful collaborative achievement. He had to surround himself with an incredible team of historians and archivists who really work as a team. They're very tight. They're, they're like a good jazz band or they riff off each other. Both the calendar and the LaGuardia archives here are very important to our role as a community college because we're, we're in a room right now and I like to think of the walls of this campus as being permeable and it goes both ways. That we really want to take the knowledge that we have and apply it in the community. The calendar is, is here because I created it and I started it and I'm still involved in it. It strikes at that stereotype of a community college. The quality that we produce here says to the world, you've got it wrong about community colleges. You know, we really are the cutting edge of teaching, of knowledge. So I feel it's a statement, and it's wonderful that it's here, because that stereotype is wrong. When something is filmed, how does it get saved for the future? Well, the Library of Congress and the Institute for Museum and Library Services are funding a program to make sure that these visual records are saved for posterity. And where is the grant being applied? Right here at CUNY TV. I make TV shows at CUNY TV, but like most of us when our job is done, at the end of the day, out of sight, out of mind. But when my work is done, the archivist's job is just beginning. And it's a job here I knew nothing about. I think from our inventory, we manage somewhere between uh, 60 and 65,000 videotapes. Currently in our database, we manage over a, a million files. Uh, this includes the video that's being submitted by production units like you for broadcast, as well as files that we're acquiring, and then the results of our own digitization efforts. So we're digitizing paper, audio, video, like the whole collection. Dave Rice manages the massive archives of public broadcasting history here. And he's the one who applied for this grant from the Library of Congress and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Enter grant recipient Dinah Handel, National Digital Stewardship Resident, or NDSR for short. Tell me, what is this National Digital Stewardship Residency? So the National Digital Stewardship Residency Program is a grant-funded program by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And basically, National Digital Stewardship Residents are people who are freshly out of library or archive uh, de master's degree programs, and they get placed at an institution to undertake a digital preservation project. So digital preservation is um, it's a concept that can be a little bit difficult to define, but I like to think of it as the practices and policies policies um, for the preservation um, of digital objects to ensure their access in the future. What exactly is a digital archivist as opposed to, say, a library archivist? Well, have you ever tried to um, open a file from 10 years ago on your computer? And I think if you try to do that, you'll see very quickly the reason for digital archivists and digital archiving. For example, like older word processing files are in a variety of different formats that are no longer in use today and that are no longer supported by current word processing software. So when we think about you know preserving items for the long term, we have to really consider like, will we be able to access this document in 10 years, in 20 years, in 15 years? And as a National Digital Stewardship resident, it's these challenges that Dinah has worked on. You see, as fast as video technology changes, so do the methods for keeping track of it all. Just think what your phone could film five years ago versus now. And that's the challenge, developing systems and standards that will allow us to not only still view audio-visual material in the future, but also to keep it organized. 
like in a library, for example, there's a catalog that you search and then you find based on metadata about the book, so the author, the title, when it was published, who published it. In the same way, you will want to find audiovisual files based on metadata. So when you search in a database, like a collections database, you'll find uh, material based on similar metadata, either descriptive or technical metadata. The challenges are so unique when it comes to audiovisual media that most NDSR grants have gone to projects like digital libraries or internet art archiving. Of all the NDSR grants awarded over the years, CUNY TV was only the second public broadcasting institution to be included. It sort of proved that the National Digital Stewardship Residency wasn't just for organizations that already had implemented like very comprehensive digital preservation programs, but could also be for institutions like CUNY TV, which work in the public university setting and are, you know, making materials accessible for via public television. I could also say that for audiovisual archivists, we have decades of experience in working with analog videotape, and working with digital audiovisual media is something that's relatively new as a community. People have been working with film for, you know, about 120 years at this point, but uh, you know, digital files is is uh, you know still quite new compared compared to that. So it's it's a field that is still much in need of. Of evolving. In fact, seeing this need for evolving the field, the Library of Congress and the Institute of Museum and Library Services are now having a new round of national digital stewardship residencies that focus entirely on public broadcasting institutions across the country. Because with each passing generation, preserving outdated media becomes harder and harder. I mean, just how well do you think the VHS tapes from your old hold movies are holding up? And at a public broadcasting station like CUNY with 30 years of footage to maintain, they've got 65,000 of them and one million files to manage. And so that's where digital archivists come in and that's why we have and think about digital preservation is because we want to ensure access to all of this information for many, many years down the line. Adding one million and one files now to their archives. For Study with the Best, I'm Ari Goldberg. You may not know Clarence Irving, but his donations to your college help create the Black Music History Archives, which houses everything and anything related to legendary African-American musicians from Queens. There were lots of musicians and jazz artists that came right out of Southeast Queens. This was a community that was created by them, uh, mostly because it was necessary. Segregation was very much in place in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s when they were here and they sort of found each other and created a community. Clarence Irving was a part of that as a promoter, as a writer, and just as, a, as an all-around good man. We are fortunate enough that York gave us an empty storage space in what used to be the periodicals area of the uh, library here at York. And in it are just bins and bins and bins that were brought from Clarence Irving's home in Long Island. But it needs manpower. So what I've been asked to do is to assess what we have, to give them an estimate of how much money it would cost in materials uh, that would be archival boxes and sheets, mylar, etc., to protect these objects, the photographs, the correspondence. It's going to require funding that I know doesn't exist right now for this purpose. Uh, we would have to create um, grants, we would have to apply for grants, etc., uh, in hopes of getting enough to process. And then I believe we will find space. This is a box of stamps that Buck Clayton put together. He's a composer and a musician, he lived on Glassboro Avenue in Jamaica, New York, right here. And what he has had created on these stamps are his own kind of language. I mean, he refers to these objects as words and music. So things like vamp till ready, uh, directions uh, for the composition and how it should be played. So some basic things like, okay, this is for clarinet, this is for trombone, there's a solo chorus, there's ensemble, but then he actually has a stamp that says, as is. And then we have his tiger bomb, which means that he probably did a lot of work with his music and always had his tiger bomb um, in hand. 
I think that this is one of the most charming and still yet, not yet 100% known or understood elements in the collection. This is the kind of stuff that a researcher would want to come and see. Just to experience the fact that all of these stamps were made by this musician and must have been used and knew where they were, you know, to create a specific song to be made in a specific way. Your college, we're right in the middle of Southeast Queens, predominantly black neighborhood. And I feel that this community has a lot of accomplishments and a lot of accomplished people. And they should be recognized in some sense so that they're not looking down on our community because it's not as bad as may have been propagandized as being. Having the archives here and then dealing with legacy of people, let's see what you did. What, 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 what did you do? What did your grandmother accomplish? Let's talk about it. Be willing to come to us and say, it would be nice if you could archive this person or this person. They did this for the church and the church did this for the community. As a black woman working in a school where we are, I would say, 92% brown-skinned people <laughs> from all over the world, uh, this archive should be something that a student writing a research paper, an undergraduate for a class, would be able to put their hands on original letters that were signed by these important people. That is a gift, a true gift. And that's what, is, what makes it important that this happens. So I'm going to sit on it. <laughs> I, I'm not going to let it rest. And um, I think the squeaky wheel will get the oil in this instance. When Tom Staples was a kid in the 90s, he used to love the cartoon Felix the Cat and anything old. Now, 25 years later, he's the owner of one of the largest archives of old cartoons and silent films in the country. have around, uh, I would say, close to 1,500 films in here, and somehow they all fit. It started uh, when I was, I would say, maybe a toddler, a very young kid, just watching things on TV, and uh, there were two reasons that I became interested in it. I grew up mostly around adults and older people who was showing me things that they saw when they were younger. And back in the 90s, you could go to any supermarket or drugstore and you could buy these inexpensive VHS tapes and they would have all these old cartoons on them. There were a couple very early cartoons like Felix the Cat and other uh, black and white and silent films that were on those inexpensive videotapes but not many. Uh, I learned about more of them when I was reading history books. And it was very difficult to find things like that, to buy them from you know, videotape distributors back then. Uh, it wasn't really until I learned about actual film prints, 16 millimeter film prints that were made 70, 80 years ago that people used to rent and show at home and that sort of thing that um, I learned that you could find more of those films in that form. There have been other collectors and other uh, archives that have collected material like this, but very few people who were focused just on this genre of film. Um, there were collectors who were 
doing great work finding them and collecting them, but also focusing on other things as well. The difference with me is that I focus just on early animation and uh, the silent era of film. And that's why I had such a, a focus and such a direct project of looking just for those films that I was able to find so many of them. I have worked with the Library of Congress, um, actually consulting with them and telling them about the animation they have and recommending things for preservation and even um, giving some of my material to them, some things that they don't have. There are a lot of different kinds of people who have taken interest in these films. I do public screenings and I get a lot of people who are completely unfamiliar with these cartoons and films and they hear about them and they just want to check it out and they, they find them to be very charming and historically significant and even educational. And then there are film historians and researchers who haven't been able to see a lot of these films over the years so they They've learned about my work and they've wanted to help out and support what I'm doing. I'm not missing anything in particular except that there are still hundreds and hundreds of things that I don't have. And many other people don't have and don't know where they are. Um, so there's always a constant search for more of these films. It never ends. That's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories, log on to our website at cuny.tv or check out our Study with the Best Facebook page. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.